Good evening. Thank you all for coming. Pretty excited for tonight. Uh, Bible school is always a good time. Yeah. Thank you for coming. I'm going to start with some prayer. God, thank you so much for tonight. Thank you for um, hey, what we heard this evening already. Thank you for the Holy Spirit and for his power. And just, um, I just guide my words tonight and Holy Spirit speak to our hearts tonight. And just um, as we apply these things to our future work, just um, yeah, help us to apply them to our lives. And Holy Spirit guide us as we um, decide what we want to do with our futures and as we go into future work for the kingdom, just, uh, just bless everyone in their future way. You say amen. This evening I get the privilege of talking about Daniel. We're going to look at some examples from Daniel, from his life, and see what we can apply to our future work in the kingdom of God. So I'm pretty excited for that. I'm going to go through four stories from Daniel. We all know the stories of Daniel, I think. I'm going to try to pull things from those and, uh, yeah, apply them to the future of the church. So the four stories we're going to look at tonight. The first one is abstaining from the king's meat. The second one is the fiery furnace. The third one is the writing on the wall. And the fourth one is the lion's den. Those are the four stories we're going to look at tonight. So tonight I would like if you guys, I don't want to, you guys don't want to hear my voice the whole time. So when I have a verse that I read out, if one of y'all could find that verse and read it. I don't know if you want to raise your hand or make a noise or something. That way not two people start at the same time. But it would really help if you guys would read the verses for me. That'd be awesome. So first story is in Daniel 1. You guys would open to Daniel 1. Starting in Daniel 1, it talks about when um, Jehoiakim the king of Judah was taken over by Nebuchadnezzar of battle. This was a punishment um, that came upon Judah because of their unfaithfulness. I read through that recently, all the kings and all their ups and downs, and it's it's a long read to read all through that because one guy would come in and he would do good for a while and then he would give in, and then after a while the next king would come up and he would do good for a while and then he might stay good for his whole life, and the next king would be just as bad as the guy that was too in front of him, and it was just, it's a rough read. But it's kind of crazy how it applies to us today as well. We, we're faithful, and then we might give in and we stumble for a while. But God is gracious, and he gives us grace. It's amazing. But this is their judgment on Judah. It's just setting them up to Babylon. So in Daniel 1, we first find Daniel. Uh, he's over 18. That's what we know. I kind of like the age thing. I don't know why. But we know that he's over 18 when he's exiled because of what he's chosen for, because of the... Um, the king choosing him to be one of the, the noble men. We know that he's over 18 just because of, um, yeah. So when, he was, when they were exiled, he was over 18. And he was chosen for this. The king chose him because he was strong, he was handsome, he was of royal descent, and he was intelligent. The king chose these men because he needed people to um, govern underneath him. And he would need pe people in the future to work underneath him in their provinces that he took them from. So he comes out and he's chosen. Wouldn't that be a great thing to be chosen by the people you're taken from? They take you from your home, thousands of miles from your home, and they choose you for this special job. What an, what an honor. You're an alien in this land. You're miles from home, and you're invited to eat at the king's table. You're given an easy life. You're going to spend the next three years in their university studying their ways, studying their different languages, studying studying everything they want to teach you. All this and for service to the king that took you away from your home. For me, it, it would be nice because you know you don't have a bad life, you know. But at the same time, you're, you're being trained to be in service to the person who destroyed your home. And <clears throat> And over this time, it could be easy to become bitter, maybe, or resentful. Maybe um, be tempted by the easy life that you have and just give up everything that you had before. There's kind of two different sides of that. He could either become bitter and hate the king or love the king and give up what he had. But he chose, he did not choose either of those. He was not angry at the king, but he also did not want to give up his old practices. And a lot of people sometimes question, like, why um, why he would not partake of the king's meat. Um, he 
wasn't at home anymore. And yeah. But he knew that some of the meat on that on that table would be unclean to him. So the meat they, they wouldn't follow the same practices. And also that meat could have been offered to idols. Idolatry was a huge part of their culture. And he never knew which would have been offered to idols and which would not. Another thing, if I if you guys have any comments or questions or anything during this thing, just Feel free to shout him out or stop me or something. But one thing that he did have going for him when he went through, when he went there, or when he was chosen, was that he had good people around him, his friends. In uh, verse seven, you can see that they have Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego as his friends, and I'm not going to try to pronounce all their names. But you can see that they change their names when they get there. Does anyone know why they did that? Or what was the significance of that? No one? It was in the language of the land. Um, Partly, yes. Yeah. So they gave them Babylonian names. But the one thing that's interesting that I found is that all of their Jewish names actually had a meaning that pertained to something with God. All of them went back to God. And all of their new names actually had a meaning for one of their idols. One of their idols was incorporated into one of their names. Into each of their names. And that'd be kind of hard too, right? You go to a different place and they just give you a whole new name, new identity, new way to live. But then he was surrounded by good influences. And they stood with him. Someone read uh, verse 8 for me. But Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine, and he asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself this way. So, he kind of challenges authority. And the reason he challenged authority was to uphold his own convictions. He knew that these things were not right for him as a person. And he challenged that authority because he knew what was truth. And it took a while, like the eunuch that he talked to, he had, they had a trial period of 10 days. And at the end of those 10 days, we can see what happened. And it doesn't really make sense why he would look better than the guys who were eating at the king's table. He was only drinking water and only eating vegetables. And the other guys had every, everything they could want. Someone read verse 15. <clears throat> and that's it. And at the end of ten days, their countenance appeared fairer and fatter in flesh than all the children which did eat the portion of the king's meat. From this, we can see that they were blessed. It doesn't really make sense um, physically, biolog biology. I don't, can't say that word. But that they would actually look better. The other guys are getting more protein, getting more nutrition, but they look better. And the only way that could happen is because of God. God blessing them. Can someone read verse 17 and 20? As, <clears throat> as for these four children, God gave them knowledge and skill in all learning and wisdom. Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. And in matters of wisdom and understanding that, king, that the king inquired of them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers that were in all his realm. Not only did they look better, but they were also better up in the head. They were smarter than anyone else in the kingdom. And it wasn't because of anything they did. It was because they were blessed by God. Because they were faithful. So what can we take away from this story? The story of abstaining from the king's me. I have two points from this story. The first is no compromise. The only way to be truly effective in the work of the kingdom is that you cannot compromise for anything. You cannot compromise the truth. You must stand up for what is right. Another point is that you must be surrounded by good, strong, faithful men or women. Friends. Without that group of friends, you will be headed for disaster. You might not be headed for complete disaster, but you will not be nearly as effective as if you have a strong group around you. Going with that, the second story I'm going to talk about is a fire furnace. I'm kind of cheating because technically Daniel's not there for this story. 
but um, it does a good story about his friends, and there's a valuable lesson to be learned from this. So we all know the story of, the, of that, the guy decides to build a monument to himself, the king. He thinks that's, that's great for everyone to worship him, so he builds this huge statue. And, sorry, I didn't tell you where we're going. This is Daniel 3 now. Turn to Daniel 3. Someone read the first verse when you get there. Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold whose height was three square cubits and the breadth thereof six cubits. He set it up in the plain of Jura in the province of Babylon. Does anyone have a different version that has the feet? Or have a Bible that tells the feet? Ninety feet and nine feet wide. It's pretty big. He thought he was he thought of himself as a pretty big thing. And King Nebuchadnezzar, he gathered all these people. And these men are included because Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are included because he gathers all the justices, he gathers the princes, he gathers all the important people to come and see his statue. And we all know the story of how at the time of the music, everyone was supposed to bow down, they're all standing, and everyone has to bow down, and these three guys refused to bow, refused to bow down. This is a part of the story that I love, because the other guys go and report them. They're like, hey, these three guys are not doing what you said. They're not being respectful. It's a pride thing. They're not giving in. The king's like, how dare these guys stand up to my authority? So he brings them into his presence, and he starts questioning them. And the thing that's interesting that I never really thought about before is that he knew these guys, because he had picked these guys to be in his university, his service for the future. These were not, he had respect for these guys. They were, because they were so, they had been faithful and had, um, they, they were smarter than other guys in the land. He knew these guys. So he questioned them and asked them why they're doing this. Why would they go up against his authority? They know his power. They know what he can do. They know he could have them killed at any time. But what do they say? In verse 17, what, is, what do they say? If it be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning fire and furnace. He will deliver us out of thy hand, O King. Did anyone catch what is something that stuck out to you from that verse? Out of his hand? That's a good one. Look for something else. If it be so, God, I'm just saying God might deliver me. No, that's not saying he will be able to. The thing that I'm looking for is, is able. They believe in the power of God. They had such a belief in the power of God that they knew that nothing could hurt, harm them. And then someone, verse, someone read verse 18 as well, if it's with it. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. What is that? What about what about that verse? Anything stick out to you about that one? Exactly. Good job. Yeah. They knew the purpose of God. They're like, even if he doesn't come down and save us, we know he has the power to, but if if he chooses not to, we're okay with that, because we know that God has a purpose. God has a plan. And we're ready, we're willing to bow down to that purpose. And someone then someone read verse 19. This is the king's response to what they just said. Then Nebuchadnezzar was filled with fury, and the expression of his face was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He ordered the furnace to be seven times more than his official duty. The thing that sticks out to me here is that his expression changed. Like I said, he knew these guys. They were like some of his favorite people. They were so smart. They were good looking. They were what he needed for his kingdom. But when they said that, his whole view of them completely changed. And he got mad at them. 
He was ready to destroy these guys. And that's something that's interesting. I think that we have, I've seen that or heard of that a lot in different um, people working in the field. That when you tell them the truth about God, when you tell them the truth about who God is, it makes people mad. Especially if they're not willing to accept him. So another story, he makes it a lot hotter. He makes it seven times hotter. This is one part that stuck out to me more than anything else reading in the past, is that he bound them. He didn't just put them, he didn't just throw them into this fire. He bound them first, and then he threw them in. And the guys who bound them and threw them in actually died because of the heat. That's how hot it was. When they got that close, they just literally just died. Someone read verse 25. He answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt, and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. So amazing. They see this, they look in the fire, and there's guys just walking around in the fire. I think that's one thing that stuck out to me more than anything, is that they were bound with rope, and the rope literally burned off their bodies, but they were untouched. I always thought of it as God just, you know, took their ropes off. But their ropes literally burned off of them and they were untouched. And the man that was with them, people say, some people think it was an angel, some people think it was Jesus. But we know that he was, his appearance was not of men. Because he said he was like a son of the gods. <coughs> and the one thing, another thing that stuck out to me, they, it says that they fell in. It doesn't just say that they pushed them in and they walked in. Because like, they were bound. They didn't just, you know, walk in. They literally threw them in on their faces into the fire. And they were on the ground, like, in the ashes. But they went in, bound, on the ground, in their face, and they walked out. They called them out and they literally walked out of the fire. Such an incredible story. So I want to read uh, verses 28 to 30. I love it. God just uses them so they, they stand up for what's right, they stand for the truth, they believe in the power of God, and they believe in his purpose. And look what God does. He promotes them in the province of Babylon. They're even higher than what they were before. They were chosen before, but now they're even higher. And the king says, there's no other God that could ever do this. No other God in the history of the world that anyone's believed in could do something like this. The one thing that's interesting is that it never says that King Nebuchadnezzar got rid of his other idols just because this God did this. And we'll see later that he was judged for that. He became an animal. So takeaways from the second story, the fire furnace. In verse 17 and 18, we see the confidence that they have. That's something that we need to have if we're going to be successful in the kingdom. We need to have confidence. They knew God's power. They didn't just think that God had power. They didn't just believe that God had power. They knew God had power. And along with that, they knew God had a purpose. Again, they didn't just think it. They didn't just believe it. They knew God had a purpose. And without this knowledge, without knowing that God has power, and without knowing that God has a purpose, we're going to be handicapped in the battle. 
for the kingdom. You go out and you try to do it on your own power, or you try to do anything within your own might, you're going to fail. You're only truly relying on God's power and knowing and trying to fulfill his purpose will you be successful. The third story, the writing on the wall, Daniel 5. So he moves a little bit along in his life here. He is now over 80 years old. It's 70 years since the exile, and there's a different king. <coughs> and uh, this is Nebuchadnezzar's son. And he decided to throw a party. So he was having a party with all his men, all his important men, and his uh, concubines and everybody, and they're having a great, good old time. And one thing that's interesting here is that he actually pulls out the things from the temple. This is one thing I never realized before. He desecrated the temple cups and bowls, and he pulled them out, and they drank wine from the te- from the cups that were meant for the temple. These were God's items, and he was desecrating them. This party, everyone was drunk. There was immorality. There was just, it was a terrible thing happening. And they were worshiped, this whole thing was to worship their gods. So not only were they using God's items for their own um, lusts and desires, but they were using it in worship to their gods. One thing also that's interesting is that the, notice that the queen is not at the party. I don't know if that says anything positive about the queen, but it also tells you how bad the party was. She did not want anything to do with it. That's how it messed up what was happening was happening. And the handwriting on the wall. I don't know how you guys would feel, but if all of a sudden a hand appeared behind me and started writing on the wall, I think you guys would freak out. Much less if you'd be drunk. And all that kind of stuff, it'd be, yeah, quite scary if all of a sudden a hand disappeared. I should have, like, made a little hand, like, hollered it. I didn't, sadly. Anyway, he immediately calls for the people, for all his smart people to come. Uh, astrologers and the Chaldeans and the enchanters and all the wise men. And then he promises all this wealth to people that will come and show him what this means. Because he knows it's a sign from the gods. This is not necessarily the god, but it's something from the gods. Supernatural. And he promises them to be a third rule of the kingdom, chain of gold, purple. And they came in and they couldn't do anything. None of their power would work. And then the queen, this is what I was saying earlier in verse 10, the queen comes in and she brings up Daniel. And the queen calls for Daniel in verse 10 and 11. I'll read it. The queen, because of the words of the king and his lords, came into the banqueting hall and the queen declared, O king, live forever. Let not your thoughts alarm you or your color change. There's a man in your kingdom in whom is the spirit of the holy gods. In the days of your father, light and understanding and wisdom, like the wisdom of the gods are found in him. And King Nebuchadnezzar, your father, your father the king, made him king, chief of the magicians, enchanters, Chaldeans, and astrologers. And also verse 14. I'll read that too. I have heard it. Sorry, this is after they call for Daniel. They call for Daniel because of what the queen said. And the king is talking to Daniel. I have heard of you that the spirit of gods, of the gods is in you. And that light and understanding and excellent wisdom are found in you. And then Daniel goes in and reminds the son what happened to his father. Right away, he starts talking about what happened to his father. He tells him about how his dad became a madman, and that was because of what all the evil he had done. Did anything stand out to you about how Daniel came to be in the presence of the king? How did he become come into the presence of the king? Or what brought that about? Sorry, it might have been confusing. 
So the reason he came into the king's presence was because of the queen. And the only way the queen knew about it was because she heard of him. He had a reputation as a man of God, or a man of the gods, in their case. That's how they, that's how they viewed him. But he was known to be wise. He was known to be able to interpret these dreams and these weird things. And then he goes on to tell him how, um, how he's going to be judged by God. And at the end, of the, the end of the chapter, it talks about how the king was actually killed that very same night. That is a mess around when he judges someone, right? So what's the takeaway from that? I'm not focusing as much on the stories tonight. I'm focusing on what we're going to take away from this stuff. A big part of working is reputation. Having a good reputation in the communities you're going to work in, in the places you're playing to go, is a huge part of it. Living among them and, do, and just doing life. That's what he did. He lived among them. He fulfilled his duties. He did his job. And he got a good reputation because of that. And that is what God used to bring him in front of the king to tell him of his, of his fate. The fourth story, the lion's den. This is in Daniel 6. Here he's 80 to 90 years old, a couple years after that. Uh, king Darius, or Darius, uh, takes over the kingdom, took it over from Belshazzar, the guy who had the writing on the wall. And he is a Mede. They took over the Mede came and took over the kingdom of Babylon. And so he has 120 people that he put over the provinces of Babylon when he took over. And Daniel was one of the top three guys that didn't have a province. They looked over the guys who had provinces. So if you do the math, he had 40 guys under him who then ruled the provinces. Is that right? Yeah. <laughs> So, yeah, he had 40 guys underneath him that he, was, that he was governing at this point. And not only that, Daniel did such a good job that he was going to be promoted to the second in the kingdom. He was going to be promoted above the three that he was a part of already. The king was so impressed with him. And the jealousy from the other guys drove him to do that. Um, to do what they did. They made a decree. They got the king to do a decree. That's saying if you pray to anyone else except for the king, they'll be put in the lion's den. And in verse 10, this is my favorite thing that Daniel ever did. When Daniel knew that the document had been signed, he went to his house where he had windows in his upper chamber, open toward Jerusalem. He got down on his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he had done previously. So he hears the decree and instantly he goes and prays to God exactly the opposite of what he's supposed to be doing. I just love that. And one thing that I think sticks out there too in that verse, verse 10, is the ending where it says, as he had done previously. This is not a new thing for him to do to pray to God. He did that all the time. And we know the story how the king was sad. He, couldn't, he didn't want to lose one of his greatest men. But he couldn't reverse it. He had to be a decree. He had to sign it with his ring. It's pretty interesting that kind of deep down, the king kind of knew, he knew that the, the God of Daniel had power. In verse 16, Then the king commanded, and Daniel was brought and cast into the den of lions. The king declared to Daniel, May your God, whom you serve continually, deliver you. He knew that, the, that that God of Daniel had power. And then he fasted for Daniel all night. He was so worked up and so distraught at losing this man who was his second in command that he fasted for him all night. And then he rushed out to find Daniel's fate and he found him alive. And one thing also that stuck out to me about this is that Daniel forgave the king. I've always overlooked that before. When the king came out and he looked down on him, he, the, Daniel forgave him. He wasn't bitter. In verse 22, My God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouth, and they have not harmed me, because I was found blameless before him. And also before, before you, O king, I have done no harm. He could have been really bitter at his friend who threw him in the lion's den without cause. 
I mean, he was he was bound by the law, but surely he had worked to try to save him, but he couldn't save him. But I just love how Daniel was not bitter because of that. He knew that God had a purpose. And then we see the just men, they met their fate. They landed down in the lion's den and were destroyed. And God was glorified because of that. Verses 26 and 27. I make a decree that in all my royal dominion, people are to tremble and fear before the God of Daniel. For he is the living God, enduring forever. His kingdom shall never be destroyed, and his dominion shall be to the end. He delivers and rescues. He works signs and wonders in heaven and on earth. He who has saved Daniel from the power of the lions. What a great testimony. So the takeaways from this one. Bible reading and prayer. You have to make them a habit before things get hard. If you aren't faithful now, how will it be when it gets hard? It has to be a habit. And the hardest and most dangerous places that we think of as humans can sometimes be the place where the kingdom of God can be the most advanced. Sometimes we have to go to those places for it to happen. And sometimes, like Nate said that earlier, I think it won't always make sense in the human brain about what God calls you to do. So, to wrap up, what do we learn from Daniel and his friends in our work for the kingdom? We must not compromise the truth. Even when surrounded by the most, by the worst evil, we cannot sway from what we know is truth. Secondly, we must surround ourselves with strong friends who will stand by our side and not compromise either. In order to be effective, we must know that God is the ultimate power. Nothing can happen to us unless he allows it. He has a purpose, and our ultimate goal is to fulfill that purpose. If we hope to further the kingdom, we need a strong reputation. One can't simply gain this overnight, but must build relationships and allow that reputation to give us opportunities to work. Habitual Bible reading and prayer will make us strong for the day when the true test comes. Without it, we are going into battle without any armor. God might take us into some of the most dark and scary places to fulfill his purpose. Are you equipped and ready to take on this challenge?